Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, your former BFF who has inexplicably left you on red for six months, and it is time for more of my Dishonored Let's Play. This is episode probably 15. I have established no consistent parameter for whether or not I say the episode number, but that's fine. And uh, today we're going to go commit a home invasion, which is always a very fun activity. So I quite enjoy this little thing because this is... um almost a kind of a dishonored location in microcosm. Oh, is he coming this way? Shit. As uh, the Pratchett townhouse kind of exemplifies all of the various values we've been talking about all the way through. Yoink. And uh, it really, <laughs> it's like a, a cat or a Sokolov's warehouse. But in microcosm, as we get to experience the highs and lows of a immersive sim level in such a, a tiny, tiny location. So it's completely self-contained, it's just this tiny little additional location. Uh, there's a few different rooms that you can go into, and there's one NPC patrolling, which is Pratchett himself, who uh, can and will draw a sword on you. He is no coward, he will draw down to defend himself and his property. Um, so... I'm going to have to be careful. In fact, I'm just... I'm not going to take any chances. Uh, I normally like to sneak through this area without doing that, because A, it saves... Uh... Oh, uh, that's fine. He's fine, don't worry about it. Uh, we've established that necks are incredibly fragile, but nobody really cares. So you can explore through this place while he also is wandering around, but you can hear the singing in this safe, so you know there's something valuable to get, even if you haven't had a look with the heart. Um. And it's just nice. It's a nice little microcosm of the designs. There's these intricate spaces to creep through. There is an NPC to avoid. There is even a narrative to it, as you can see. The environmental storytelling is as strong here as anywhere else. He's packing up to leave. Makes sense. There's a plague in the city and he's a wealthy man. The Isle of Morley. This might become relevant to uh, some things I want to say later. The Isle of Morley, excerpt from a volume on Morley geography and culture. It's said that the history of Morley is as colourful as a quilt made from all of the flags ever flown and all of the clothes ever worn. The land itself hides from the sun under a layer of clouds, and a thick grey moss hangs from the trees, but the spirit of the people who live in Morley dances in the firelight. Among the people, the love of good food and drink is legendary, with stews and roasted meat dishes most often used to fight off the cold and the dreariness. The nation has a rich tradition of poets, musicians and philosophers, even amongst the poorest folk. Intellectual tomes and bar songs alike were often penned in Morley. A late entry into the Empire, Morley's, the Morley Insurrection is still a sore point for many natives, and independence is a proud character trait amongst the people. So, um... Yeah. Actually, let's check this first. Remember that the truth is in the paintings. The way to the truth starts in the crowded streets. Continue till you see a whaling ship, then find the slaughterhouse. So this is his incredibly... I'll be honest, it's as endearing. I like the idea of someone who decides to hide their personal safe code in the paintings in their house. It's such an odd thing to do, but um, I enjoy it quite a lot. So that's number seven. So the second one was a seven. And uh, then there was two other numbers that we need to find in paintings elsewhere in the house. So as you can see, it is it is one of these like dishonored locations in microcosm. There's multiple entrances and exits. Every floor has a balcony that's accessible, except the ground floor, which has a front door, which is locked, unless you manage to steal his key, which you can easily do before he goes indoors. Um, or you can just knock him out and take it, of course. It has the roof access there. Um, it has these different floors with different uses and different bits of, you know, just environmental storytelling in the area. Young Prince of Tivia, some hagfish to steal. Clearly his uh, competitor's brand. So here we have the slaughterhouse and the number is three. So let's go add that. And this actually brings me to a point I had meant to talk about ages ago, um, which is the other aspect of the two, uh, was it first or third? So the slaughterhouse is the third number. So that was three, I believe. Nope, uh, yeah. Um, so the other aspect of the paintings, prized by the people of Dunwall, and presumably therefore Bristol more widely. I talked before about the um, kind of the menacing aspect of nature, these kind of intimidating blasted landscapes that reflect a, a people who, who fear the world they live in, rather than uh, existing in concert with it. This is a very 
common example thereof, because as I've said before, there's only about eight, eight paintings in the entire game, not counting the Sokolov paintings, which are all unique. Um, and the other, um, the other example is what I like to think of as bustling scenes of industry. They're these very kind of like strong, very Victorian, I mean, they're a lot more impressionist than Victorian paintings are because they are also, I believe, repurposed concept art from the early stages of uh, game design. But, um, you know, textually they're present in the game as art within this place, so we have to consider that that is what they are, that this is the art these people prize. And um, it re reflects this very kind of industrialist Victorian ideal, these these ideas of um, we are going to have a, we're going to have this kind of like high energy respect for for the ways that technology and industry can un uplift mankind. We have, you know, stirring boats, bustling street scenes. There's even one in particular which I find the strongest example of this design uh, inspiration, where there is a, a lighthouse blasting rays of light out into the city, which um, it's just occurred to me. I could have brute forced this, but, you know, whatever. So here we have... Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's uh, these kind of, like, thrilling scenes of industry as we see uh, the ways that places may may be altered and improved by the existence of of industry. It's a very Victorian ideal and it's uh, also something that was reflected in a lot of um, post-Victorian art after the turn of the century, which is also fitting to the other inspirations for the time that, takes, that this game takes place in. It's a very kind of uh, 20s and 30s thing. Um, futurism even uh, takes a similar inspiration. So I am going to skip over these journal entries because it's basically just the downfall of a man succumbing to obsession and madness, which is going to be relevant to what I'll talk about in a moment. But first, we need to dip in here and read, well, listen to this. Rivers change course over many lifetimes, and eventually all bridges tumble down. A thousand years ago, there was another city on this spot. The people carved the bones of whales into runes and inscribed them with my mark. Children still find them washed up in the river mud. Anton Sokolov has made a great study of my runes, but he's not special like you are. He wasn't chosen and he doesn't wear my mark, so he can't unlock their secrets. Sokolov believes there are specific words and acts that can compel me to appear before him. He searches old temples in Pendicia and ruined sub-basements in the flooded district. He performs disgusting rituals beneath the old abbey. But if he really wants to meet me, he could start by being a bit more interesting. So this brings me back to some stuff I said previously about the outsider. The outsider is a really interesting figure to me as a car- oh wow. Look at that view! That's gorgeous. Oh, I, I miss living in a really big city, I say, in a city of 200,000 people as if that's not big, but fuck you, I'm from London. That's genuinely gorgeous. So the, um, the painting of the lighthouse I mentioned is actually a painting of Caldwin's bridge. Uh, there's beams of light blasting from the height of the tower, sort of enlightening and enlivening the populace below. Um, I'll point it out again if I see it anywhere. So once again, um, I've talked previously about the way that the the riverside is used to place you in your geographical context. Caldwin's bridge is visible from the hound pits, and here we are actually on the damn thing. In fact, I think the hound pits is over there somewhere, although don't quote me on that. Actually, no. It would be upriver because of the position of the clock tower, I think. Well, anyway, that's besides the point. So, back to what I was saying. The Outsider is an interesting figure because he's very much presented as kind of a trickster deity. Um, people believe that you can compel his gaze, that you can draw his attention, and that this is beneficial to you, uh, because he might grant you some kind of ability or power. But there is a lot more to it than that. And there is both the way he is presented in the game, and the way he actually works if you think about the, the, the kind of, like, mystical conceptual mechanics going on. Which brings me back to my regular soapbox. Let's just have a quick look at these posters. This is... This is this is important. See the unknown assailant? If you are... If you don't leave witnesses, or you are not spotted, and you successfully are on... 
you don't have to be ghost, but just mostly not be noticed. They, these are the the wanted posters that appear for you. It's a really nice detail that they that they um, that they change this. If you are, are spotted a lot and you leave witnesses, then you get instead pictures of your mask and the masked man or the masked brigand or whatever the fuck they decide to call you is is what you see on these posters instead. Uh, anyway, back to mysticism. So, the thing about um. Well, this regular soapbox that I climb on whenever I'm doing Let's Plays is basically that uh, fandoms in general, and especially game-playing fandoms, have this unfortunate tendency to um, both believe everything they're told, um, to take everything that is in a work as kind of fundamental gospel truth, regardless of who said it and why, um, and to assume that if there is one way that things work, then it must be the way that all things work. There is no room for complexity or um, any further depth or that kind of thing. Arc pylon. Touch the charger before your ship when the duty officer brings it by, and the arc pylon will fry you. Those things? Give me the willy, sir. You'll be thankful when Slackjaw's boys come down the street to slit your ricker. It'll be fun to watch them turn to ash. Police is the same everywhere. So in a moment, there's a scripted event where several uh, several bottle streeters run through here and get vaporized. But um, they imply that there's definitely been a death rate for the amount of people who have been disintegrated uh, by coming on shift and not properly polarizing themselves beforehand. Eventually, sure. He's the only one who can tell us about the pearls. But let him rot in a cell a while longer. He'll be more careful next time. So I believe these guys are the ones that run out, but I can't be certain. I may have not triggered that, or it might be different depending on some stuff you do, but last time I went through this level, they definitely went and got themselves disintegrated. I only have four bolts, so I'm not going to uh, save their lives, even though I would quite like to, simply because... Um, well, I could drop one bolt, maybe. I am a kindly deity. Much unlike Bastard Corvo, who is incredibly cruel and quite unfair. I'm going to tuck him in the bin, though. Just, just put them gently to bed. Draw the covers up to their chin, and they'll be fine waking up in the municipal dump, which I'm sure they don't have, like, big crushes or anything. Uh, what the fuck was I talking about? Right, so yeah, there's clearly a casualty list um, of members of the uh, the guard who did not come on shift properly polarised. Which is kind of terrifying if you think about it. You really would not think that they would accept that kind of thing. But, so, it's time for me to try and pull off something pretty quick. Here we go. Perfect crime. So this area is pretty dangerous because, oh, environmental storytelling, these guys clearly had a gambling fight. Uh, this area is incredibly dangerous because this uh, room is actually within the blasting radius of that arc pylon, which means that if you walk in here, it shoots through the window and electrocutes you instantaneously. So if you want to bypass it, you can stop time or you can kill people and fight your way over there or you can get a sufficient number of things to go through the area and get blasted. I believe it's possible to lean out of cover so that it shoots at you, um, thus expending some of its charge, and if you do that in, like, time it right, you won't get hit by, by the bolts. Alternatively, uh, you can be clever and do this sort of thing. You can't shoot it out because the steel cover is over it, which is unfortunate. Can I reach that rooftop? Nope. Which means I should probably try from higher. Anyway, so um, my regular soapbox is, is that thing about all of the ways that people go, ah, but character X said this, therefore that must be how it works, or this can't be a metaphor, it has to be physically literal, all of these kinds of things. Now this might be a mistake. was a little bit of a mistake. He got alerted, but he didn't get fully alerted. He's he's suspicious because he heard me thump 
onto the rooftop. So I'm actually not going to explore this area in super great detail. The objective of this area is to get to the top, uh, well, to get to the light controls, turn off the light controls, and then get to the other side of the bridge. Because this is, uh, let me see if I can get this. Oh, okay, there we go, great. Uh, this is a heavily guarded bridge. This is the only way through um, on the Renhaven River. Uh, if you want to get into the inland or out to the ocean, you have to go through this bridge, which, as you can see, raises and lowers. I was talking before about the way this bridge is clearly based on the classical depictions of the medieval London Bridge, which was, of course, rebuilt by the Victorians in a completely different form and then uh, rebuilt again in the 70s, um, resulting, I believe, in the form that it still has today. Anyway, it's heavily guarded. Our objective is to switch these lights off, get to the other side. I'm not going to talk about this area in any more detail because there's not really any further insult insights than I've already said about the various clever areas designed in uh, Dishonored. Ouch. Uh, <laughs> except that also it's very tall and if you fall off it will hurt quite a lot. So, uh, right, yes, I was talking about like mysticism and magic and the idea that, well, Everyone who has magic... People think that everyone who has magic powers in this world must have gotten them from the outsider in some way. And that the outsider is a kind of a trickster god who kind of naturally exists the way that gods do. Uh-oh. See, I remembered that I promised myself to start carrying my, uh, my crossbow out in hand. And, and I did not do that, but luckily for this guy I was too far away to stab him in the neck, which is my usual instinct in these sorts of situations. Anyway, let's not leave him anywhere obvious to be found, just in case. He will be absolutely fine up here. We're not going to form a dude pile. He'll he'll wake up and, and startle and, and be, be, oh no, but then he knows there's a hatch here. He'll be fine. This isn't, this isn't a delayed murder. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm not going down there because although there's loads of resources to gather, they're not resources I need since I'm not killing. And, um... I'm, I'm pretty good on everything else. I don't think there are any knockout darts in this area. Knockout darts are usually only found as environmental storytelling items to indicate that someone likes to take drugs. They aren't usually found in, for example, police resources, because, you know, God forbid the police use a non-lethal weapon once in a while. And, um, yeah, so... These up here are the, uh, are the target. Irritating. I want to I want to put them through that hole, but whatever. Now, I probably should try and get down into the bottom part of this one, actually, because there is a side quest. And I do actually want to show off any and all side quests wherever possible. Anyway, uh, I keep getting distracted, but... So I have no, no idea how far I just jumped back, but I managed to get myself very spotted by several men, which is less than ideal when you're trying not to be extremely murderous. Anyway, I was talking about my, uh, my whole thing. So ultimately the way it works is that people tend to go, oh, well, the dis the, the outsider is, is, is the god of this world. He is this peculiar trickster deity. That's a lot of these guys. He is this peculiar trickster deity who gives people magic powers because he thinks they'll do interesting things with them. But there's a lot more to it than that. People think that that's the only way that you can get magic powers in this world. Um, you know, people who've played these games think that, even though it's very obviously and canonically not the case if you, uh, if you do play them. Because there are rituals that can be done. There are bone charms. Bone charms do not draw on the void through the power of the outsider, they are their own thing. They use whalebone, which has its own magical power because essentially the whales exist in the void and in the real world at the same time. It's, you know, it's not complicated. It's not a complicated idea. Please stop being so prescriptive in your beliefs. Everybody who reads and plays, uh, everybody who plays and uh, enjoys video games. You've all heard me make this rant a hundred times before. I'm not gonna get into too much detail again here. But the point is the outsider is presented to to you as a as a as a character in this world as the magic flying guy who gives you powers and provides you exposition and shows up occasionally to taunt you cryptically 
However, what he is within the context of the setting is completely different. He is the whispering thing in the night. I've talked about this before as well, but this leads me to what I'm actually trying to get at, namely, um, the outsider himself is not the only method or tradition by which, a uh, little flex there in case you were wondering, I am quite good at this. So, um, for example, the bone charms also let you draw on the power of the void. And oh, there's plenty of water where you're going, you <laughs> river. Fly. Let's just take a quick look, see. That's one guy, that's another guy. I think there's only these two guys here. So if I knock them out, out of sight of anybody from beyond the windows, we are good. I, I'm just gonna rewire this alarm panel as well, just in case. So, um, the reason for this is that the Void is a fundamentally corrupting force. It is, it is a force that exists and can be manipulated in various ways. It leaks through into the world naturally, and of course you can use things like whalebone to create your own tools. But the issue is not how you interact with that, uh, with that power, but how you interact with it safely. Listen, I ain't no criminal. I just collect river cross pearls. They chase me down. And I had to hide my catch. You help me, and I'll show you where the pearls are. Split them with you. The goal of rituals and bone charms Wait, is. Don't be a fool. We can split the pearls. Whatever you want. I'll come me. back in a second. I'm trying to talk to my to my uh, my viewers. So there's a couple guys over there who I also want to avoid. I'm not sure which way this guy goes. I think he goes out and around down there, which means we'll probably be fine. However, if he gets himself murdered, I don't care. So I'm just going to talk over him while he runs. Just follow me. I'll show you the place. No one saw me drop it. Anyway, um... You won't be sorry. We can split him right down the middle. Now I'm out of that cell, I'm feeling myself again. Rituals, bone charms. These are all methods by which people have tried to manipulate the raw power of the Void um, in such a way that they can use it without being corrupted or whatever else you want to say. This very often doesn't work because, as I've said, the Void itself is a fundamentally corrupting force. It is it is a pathway to power, but it is also um, a natural force that provokes obsession, that provokes many negative uh, emotions, paranoia, obsessiveness, um, you know, an all-consuming desire to expand your knowledge and power of it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna grab this guy. So, um, the quest is of course that you get him to the other side, but, um, if you let him out and he runs and gets himself murdered, then that's not great for you. Um, however, I will just tell you what his quest is, which is that he leads you into an ambush. Um, he leads you through a group of river crusts that try to eat you. That's the, the cache of pearls he was talking about. Um... So in addition to that, he then leads you into an actual ambush with several other thugs. And uh, we, don't want, we don't want any of that. That is not our scene. I say, as a terrible thug. <laughs> it's really hard to aim. That's a bit better. I have increased the crosshair opacity. Um, the default crosshair that the game uses, I think, is incredibly silly looking. So, um... Oh, there's one more. I say, dodging neatly out of the way, like a pro. So, anyway. <laughs> there is this, uh... There is this tradition of attempting to find ways to safely interact with the power of the void, because it does exist and people will try and use it. The outsider is not natural. He is not um, a natural component of this of this uh, conceptual realm. The outsider was constructed by humans. This is uh, spoilers for um, Dishonored: Death of the Outsider, which is the standalone sequel, not sequel, standalone uh, expansion to Dishonored 2, and is very good. And I heartily recommend playing it. It is probably the best Dishonored has ever been. So if you get the chance, do play it instead, but 
yeah, it's essentially revealed that he was created in order to be a safe method of interacting with the Void. And he, he is a safe method of interacting with the Void. Um, although people do terrible things with them, that's because the powers themselves kind of lend themselves to ter doing terrible things. Um, and the outsider what? himself... Sorry, buddy, but I mean, you were you were waiting here to kill me. It's fine. Uh oh, now how those guys knew that I was doing this, I do not know. Sometimes, uh, sometimes this game is a little bit, a little bit buggy, a little bit unfair with what people can and can't tell. They should not have been able to hear or see any of the things I did. So I'm gonna wait here while they calm down. And, uh, so yeah. The ultimate way that this, uh, kind of happens is that he is a young boy sacrificed in order to construct an entity in the Void that can manipulate the Void for the benefits of, benefit of entities outside of the Void. However, the downside of creating a god is that You've just created someone with godlike power, and if that god is disinclined to uh, appreciate you, then, well, congratulations, you just create. Was there another. Was there another. There was definitely. Oh no, I know where it was. The rune I found was the outside a shrine rune. It's fine. So I'm gonna get out of here before it's too much of a further trouble. Um, anyway, so the Outsider was created for this purpose. He is a mechanism by which people have tried to create. I've definitely missed a rune somewhere, that's no good. Is this the final... Oh, this actually isn't the final cell. Okay, so... Um, this is probably the most individual cells that any, any level in the game has, I believe. It's a sequence of like six or seven different cells as you enter these different areas. So, uh, we'll explore this area next episode. I just want to finish my thought because, as always, I'm incredibly distractible and I have very bad allergies today, which makes me even more distractible. Anyway, um... He was a tool created to uh, observe and manipulate the Void, but, um... He is not the only way. We see other characters in the supplementary materials to these games, and we see the Bone Charms themselves that are clearly whale-based rather than, you know, outsider-based. Um... And, you know, Bone Charms aren't made by people who have the Outsider's uh, appreciation. He only gives his mark to about eight... He's, he, eight people in the world at this point have his mark. He only gives them to extremely rare and exceptional individuals. Um, so there is this idea that it is a corrupting force that is, is, is troublesome in the world. Anyway, uh, I had a more salient point that I was building to, but I stopped and started so many times I've completely forgotten what it was. Let's just leave it here. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode, even though I did go off the rails a little bit towards the end. That is going to be all for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements, and one-tweet micro-reviews, or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi, or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.